Hi, everybody. My name is Candace Boutel. I'm with Inspire Sheboygan County. We are very excited to be hosting a session today on the career path of a veterinarian. We have Dr. Joseph Richard with us today, and we're going to be doing the question and answer part of the session now, students. So as you're listening to his story, you can start asking those questions in the chat, and we are going to be taking a tour around the facility. So if things pop up in your mind while we're checking out that area, you certainly can enter questions into the chat. So Dr. Richard, if you just want to start by telling us your story and kind of your path of how you got to be where you are. Name is Joseph Richard. I actually grew up in foster care. I was in foster care from two years old until I was, uh, I aged down at 21. You can age down at 18. I chose to take care of the, uh, the benefits uh, that they give you until 21. I told you that specifically so I could let you guys know that it doesn't matter your background, where you grew up or anything like that. You can do whatever you want to do. You just have to commit. You have to want and then do. Okay. I was 18. I went to college, undergrad in Pennsylvania. I applied to vet school when I was my junior year of college and I got denied. Right. So your dreams don't always come true on your first try. But then I got a little bit more experience, applied again after my senior year, and I got almost recruited to a vet school um, at that point in time. They were very excited to have me. Um, went to Ross University. It's in um, St. Kitts, right? Went there. The way that it's set up is a little different from um, traditional American schools, right? American schools, you go there for four years, and then boom, there it is. Um, you have your vet, vet degree if you pass it. With Ross, you go there for two years, do the didactics or um, where you sit down and learn. And essentially that anywhere from like four to eight hours, just sitting down and staring at somebody lecture at you. And it can be so hard. It can be boring. There are not everything that you learn is uh, exciting and super applicable. But anyway, the second part of uh, the Ross University thing is after you learn, you go on and move to clinics and you go to clinics at a state school or wherever you want to go. So, uh, there's some that are over um, overseas in Australia, et cetera. I'll let you know that when you're trained as a veterinarian, you're trained for everything the whole year. There are certain schools where you can track. So they only teach you about certain um, like small animal, large animal, uh, exotics, et cetera. <clears throat> um, I'm a small animal veterinarian. However, I have worked on cows, emu, guinea pigs, rabbits. So, but mostly it's just dogs and cats. Okay. Awesome. Um, you know what, Dr. Richard, we already have some questions coming in. So mm -hmm. um, let me start bringing some of those up. So first off, you went to undergrad, did I understand that correctly, in Pennsylvania? Yes. Okay. And what was your actual major there? My major was small animal science pre-vet, but I had a minor in psychology. Oh, awesome. And then when you went to on to vet school, how many years did it end up taking you to complete all of your schooling, and then you were talking about, you know, your clinicals. Pre-vet degree in undergrad was uh, eight years, or four years, excuse me. I don't want to kill anybody. Um, four years of just regular undergrad degree, and then there's an additional four years of the vet degree, right? So when I went to uh, Ross University, I spent um, two and a half years on the island doing the didactics that I talked about. And then the additional, a little over a year doing my clinical year, uh, clinical rotations, which is uh, just putting all of that learning into practice. Can you clarify what country you were in when you were in vet school? St. Kitts is the country. It's, it's a independent country. country. Oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, it's in a, it's in a uh, Caribbean island, which sounds, you know, like fun. It's a third world country and it was 32 miles in area, not perimeter, area, which means extremely small, gets redundant. <laughs> so then did you travel to any of the, any other locations to do some of your clinical work as you were studying, or did you do it all there? Most of my clinical training was in America, you know, but I will say they did some on the island, like four months of clinical on St. Kitts. 
but I also went on my own to make sure I went to different countries to uh, do things. There are uh, programs out there to where you can sign up to work in another country without your vet license, you know, while you're in vet school. And they'll, uh, they'll have a, a licensed vet with you to help you, you know, make sure you're not making any mistakes or get through it. I went to Guatemala to do one of those programs. It was just like a, a spay neuter clinic, you know, to get your hands ready. Excellent. So we have kind of a few tracks of questions. So maybe yep. let's start, continue, I should say, with the, the education path that we're talking about. Are there mm-hmm. other majors that you could have as an undergrad that would lead you into veterinary school. I uh, One student was asking about biological science. Are there some other majors that would still work? All right. Short answer, yes. You can, I know people who uh, did psychology and certain people who did biology. A lot of people do biology just as a fallback if they choose not to be a veterinarian after a while. But you can choose whatever major you want to do. It's just you have to know you're going to apply to be a vet. Therefore, when you meet with your advisor in college, you have to tell them that. And then they'll say, this is the specific classes you have to take. So you can go to college for criminal justice or whatever. And as long as you have those necessary classes, you can um, still get into vet school. No problem. That is very helpful. Students are also wondering, because many of our students might be in middle school or high school at this time, what are some things they could be doing as you know, young adults that could start preparing them for a career? Oh, definitely. Volunteering, right? Everything that you can put on your resume helps you become uh, competitive. All of the volunteering that you do, that'll uh, help you get into a good college and look good on a resume when you officially apply. But in any animal experience, everything boils down to experience. So um, any, any animal experience that you have, at first when you start out, your resume will look pretty weak. There won't be a lot um, of experiences on there, but if you put anything there and then you get the first job, cause there's somebody starving uh, at one point in time for somebody to help them, you know, whether it be a volunteer at a shelter or um, we have kennel kids at our practice. I'm sure there's other veterinarians that have kennels that you could um, either volunteer or get paid to work there. Excellent. That's super helpful. So I think you were going to do, you were going to show us around, which would probably lead us into the idea of what is a day, what is a day in the life of a vet look like? And maybe even some of the other employees that you have there, what, if they're not a veterinarian, what else could you do in the field? Yes. All right. So I got to go downstairs. I'll show you around the upstairs. Not a lot to go around. Um, essentially this is the break area, right? Which, like I said, not a lot lot to go around. It's just, uh, you know, there's a chair, there's a couch. I take a nap every day during my break. Naps are very important. Get your sleep. All right. A lot of people like to stay up till 4 a.m. During vet school, you might have to do that. But until then, after then, make sure you get your sleep. Uh, this is the office for the manager. I don't come in here much. That's where you get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble. I like my job. That's basically it. You know, there's a pandemic, so I have to put on my mask because I'm about to be around a lot of people. Here's an autoclave. Essentially, when you do surgery, you have to be clean, right? Um, And autoclaves are the thing that clean your instruments, you know? So I'm sure you've seen movies or shows or something like that where uh, you see a doctor in surgery and he's like, scalpel, boom, you know, uh, hemostat. Those are the tools that you use. And that is the autoclave that cleans the tools. We're about to be doing some renovation. That's why there's a dumpster there. Most of the time, it's not there. Small break room. Um, our office likes to stay excited and hype. So uh, we have a lot of uh, food out today. It was our Halloween day. So we have uh, just food here. Behind all our food, we have our supplies right in our garage. There's everything you can imagine here from, you know, prescription foods for dogs, cats, um, all of our medicines here are the backup medicine, you know, gloves, uh, things that we sell like uh, preventatives for fleas, ticks, bandage material, all those supplies. They're all here. Uh, We have our lockers and our coat rack. Nothing important there. Time to be gross. This is our poop room, right? This is where we look at uh, feces. <clears throat> literally i don't do it i'm a doctor they pay me too much 
Um, they don't pay me enough. <laughs> that was my receptionist. Um, so, um, this is a microscope, right? So when you uh, prepare the poop, you sit there, look underneath it, see if there's any uh, eggs. You know, we have things to remind ourselves of all the different kinds of eggs, all the different kinds of things inside of the urine that you can see. There's so much that you can do in this room. We have, because uh, there's multiple ways you can look at feces and, and urine, all that weird stuff that you can look at underneath a microscope. This is one place where we can do it. All right. <clears throat> I'm sure I'm getting questions by the bundle right here. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So if, you, uh, if you're not the person that looks at that, who does do that examination? Oh, simple. So doctors can't do everything. They leave the really important things to the doctors. And then um, the things that are still very important, a little more time consuming, we give to techs or assistants. And a tech or an assistant is um, essentially a nurse for a veterinarian. So while I am writing prescriptions, diagnosing a patient, doing my physical exam, my tech is looking at the feces, running diagnostics, getting a uh, paperwork ready, things like that. And Julie, someone had asked, do you own your own practice or what does the structure look like of the business? <clears throat> so I am not business minded at all. I specifically went out of my way to make sure I don't own a practice. There's a whole lot of numbers. I'm great with numbers, but I, I knew that'd be far too much for me. I'm the lowest doctor on the totem pole. I, I just came here a little over a year ago. I just had my anniversary, honestly. But essentially, there's my practice is owned by an overarching uh, corporation. This seems kind of, you know, like it could be negative, but it's actually a positive thing because um, they give me good benefits because essentially they skim a little bit off the top of our profits. That's all the money that we make um, after we take away all of the... Uh, inventory and all that crap. Corporation, and then there's a manager who reports to the manager of a corporation. And then uh, we have lead doctors, um, regular doctors, techs, and then uh, receptionists and assistants. All right? Yeah, so there's there's multiple different ways that you could be involved or employed at a veterinary clinic. What are like the hours of your clinic or what hours might you work on a typical day, and does it include weekends? Hours range from veterinary hospital to veterinary hospital. There's a lot of different ones out there. My hospital specifically is open eight to seven, Monday through Thursday. On Friday, they give us an, uh, an extra hour to ourselves, eight to six. On, Friday, or on Saturday, it's nine to six. But there are other hospitals out there that go 24 hours, or um, another hospital that I um, interviewed at went from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., et cetera, you know? So you can find you can find one that matches the way you want to be treated, right? Sure. Um, do you have to like take call then? I imagine obviously you don't have to work all of those hours if there's other vets there. Um, how does, oh, do definitely. you have a regular yeah. schedule, a weekly schedule for yourself? So my schedule is, it can be kind of complicated looking at it from the out in, but essentially the veterinarians rotate, or Fridays and Saturdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, I'm in surgery, Monday, I'm 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Wednesday, I'm 9 a.m. to 7 p.m., you know, so it's really, uh, I'm here a majority of the day, we get stuff done, so whatever we have to do. Awesome, well, let's talk about that, so mainly what animals do you see at the clinic? Yeah, yeah, um, so mainly I see dogs and cats. There are times where I see, uh, I've seen guinea pigs and rabbits. I had a rabbit whose eye was hurt is the easiest way to put it. Um, so I had to take it out. The doctor word is uh, I did a nucleation, right? We took the eye out of the rabbit. So I had to do that surgically, but yeah, mostly dogs and cats. They're wondering if you've seen rats and reptiles also. <laughs> so reptiles are pretty complicated. So I, I specifically don't see them yet. I'm trying to do a little bit more research um, and education to keep myself up to date so that I can be better. I haven't seen a rat yet. However, there are um, people with rats and they do come here. I just, I haven't seen them yet. I see. And the students are also wondering about different exotic animals. Tegan is wondering if you've ever seen a fox come in. Like if somebody finds an injured animal, do they bring them to you or where should they take them? Veterinarians actually need a, uh, a license to work on wildlife. And the practice itself needs to have a license 
to work on uh, wildlife. So nobody's brought a fox or anything like that. I think the closest I've gotten is uh, I had to euthanize a um, a bat. So unfortunately, uh, I don't get to see all those crazy cool animals. If you want to deal with those, you could be a zoo vet. Like I said, there's a lot of different kinds of uh, vets out there. And the zoo vets are the ones, in my opinion, that have the most fun. They're the ones that see all the crazy animals you could possibly think of. Are you considered like a wildlife biologist as well? Would that be something related to the practice? A wildlife biologist isn't a veterinarian. However, I'm sure those uh, rehab people have close ties with those. So I can't speak specifically on their job title. I just know they're not veterinarians. But there are... I think zoo vets can work on wildlife. What is the hardest part of your job? Oh, man. Hopefully I don't forget this question, but I need to hit on something really quick. Pre-being a veterinarian, going to vet school will be, and let me emphasize this, it will be the hardest thing that you will ever do in your life. The studying is extremely intensive. You know, I went to college and I did uh, minimal studying. I went to vet school and I had to study every single night. When there was a test, I studied double time for two weeks, and then I came out with uh, with good enough grades, right? Uh, and the tests are pretty hard. They're, they're all multiple choice, which sounds great. But, you know, sometimes you're getting multiple choice questions that all look exactly the same, but with like slight details moved. And you have to know, because as a doctor, you have to know every single thing back, forward, sideways, it can be difficult. And uh, there's a huge board test that you have to take to be a, um, a doctor too. And that takes literally months to study for after you're done. You usually take it during your clinical year. I'm kind of doubling back. They charge you an arm and a leg for that. But the hardest part as an actual veterinarian is clients. Now that's not to say that uh, dealing with people is hard. It's just, um, you know, when you come in with a, a sick animal, that's like having your sister, your brother, your grandma, a family member that is in pain. And when a family member's in pain, a lot of times um, the clients can turn to, uh, to rape or you know, being easily escalated. So you have to keep a calm mind, understand where they're coming from. Empathy is an extremely important part of this job. If you lose the empathy, then you may not, but essentially you get put in situations where um, there's a client that um, is concerned and sometimes your hands are tied. And unfortunately, we can't, we have to keep the lights on. We have to pay for inventory and all this good stuff. So um, it's really hard when somebody's like, my dog got hit by a car and they love their dog. You know, it's like two years old. So they just started to get to know it. It's still happy, lovey. It should live another 10 years, but they don't have the money and we can't pay for it. You know, so putting it down every single time I have to put an animal down, if not on the outside, on the inside, I shed a tear. Yeah, that's really, that's completely understandable. And that's a great example of our skill today about being able to relate to others and, and how difficult that must be as, as part of the job. Let's flip to the other side. What do you enjoy most about your job? The reason I got into being a vet is because of puppies. <laughs> <laughs> um... You do get to see, or at least I do, I don't know, maybe other people don't get to, but uh, there's a fair amount of puppies, you know? Um, with every old animal that you have to put down, there's usually a puppy that comes in too, you know? So yin and yang, I, I truly enjoy every single puppy that comes in. Um, they're so full of energy and happy and, you know, they're just ready to be molded. And yeah, it's just a beautiful thing. That's fantastic. Do you have animals of your own? <laughs> so unfortunately I live um I don't own in ha a house because I'm not married yet but um I rent so because I rent I have a landlord and the landlord even though I'm a veterinarian doesn't allow animals I he essentially wanted me to write a, a paper about how I can be different than anybody else and I was like if you don't see that by the fact that I'm a veterinarian well then I guess I don't need an animal he so, wasn't gonna be I'll be moving soon <laughs> that's awesome yeah. um so olivia was wondering has an animal ever like bitten you while you were trying to help it have you ever been injured while helping an animal oh definitely that's that's a part of the job it's a hazard so i said that you have to relate to um the humans right the owners but 
you also have to relate to the animal to understand and be a good veterinarian too. So dogs may be able to understand, sit, stay, um, it's a treat, you know, I'm your owner, et cetera. The problem is they don't understand everything that uh, we do. If you take a dog into uh, the vet, they don't realize that, you know, you're trying to help them, right? So um, you have to real to put yourself in their position. Okay, uh, I usually stay in this specific box and now I'm moved to a different place where I don't know people. So I'm a little afraid, you know, I'm timid. It's like the first day of high school or uh, first day of school, right? And then you have some random person coming up and touching all over you in places. Sometimes you're not uh, used to being touched, right? So like, how many times have you touched the back of your dog's uh, leg, right? <clears throat> it's really weird. It kind of feels like a biting sensation. So some dogs are very uncomfortable with it. That's totally understandable. Sarah wants to know what kind of surgeries do you do most often? I do surgeries every Tuesday. Um, a majority of my surgeries are uh, spays, neuters. Um, so getting the dogs fixed, right? Yeah, dogs, cats, uh, I've done bunnies. Yeah. Excellent. Tegan is wondering, how do you treat fish? Do you know anything about treating fish or do vets treat fish? Uh, there are vets that treat fish, especially uh, if you've gone to an aquarium, there's aquarium vets that treat those. Um, that's not my specialty. I'll be honest. That's my weakness. Every vet has a, a weakness. And uh, I knew that I like land animals, right? Um, I do the more I work with birds, the more I like them. But the easiest way to treat a fish, you can sedate them with special powder and then work from there. There's a cool thing um, called an ultrasound. Essentially, it, it picks up sound. And so you can put the ultrasound on water and you can essentially take an x-ray. That's the closest thing I can uh, explain of the fish through the water while it's swimming. Awesome. Yeah. And Bella's just wondering, for those different types of animals that you've mentioned throughout this session, is the schooling route pretty much the same? And then I imagine you would just get different experiences to kind of specialize? Yeah. So like I said, when you go to school, they kind of uh, teach you how to be any kind of vet. But there are certain schools that are better for certain pets. Certain schools are good in uh, exotics. Certain schools are good for zoo vet, et cetera. You know? So all you have to do is a little bit of research to figure out which school is the way you want to go. That's that's really sound advice. And students, we are going to be wrapping up pretty soon here. Dr. Richard is obviously very busy. Lakin was wondering, how many animals do you think you see a week? I see probably 20 animals a day, maybe a little more, at least at least 100 animals a week. And I imagine you do have, you know, you get to see some of these animals grow up because you see them for their well checks and things over the years. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, as we're wrapping up here, students, we're going to put a survey into the chat. But Dr. Richard, what other advice do you have for students who are interested in this as a potential career path? Oh, and if you would touch on this, that always sensitive question, kind of that salary range for a veterinarian as well. Salary depends on how much of a go-getter you are, right? The beauty of the overarching corporation is they tend to pay more, but at the same time, if you go to the right places, you can get more or less money. Uh, so if you look online, the salary for a vet is like $65,000 a year, but there are a plethora of people who, you know, demand higher, right? I was one who knew my worth, you know, I spent so much time at home and I, uh, I want to be able to raise a family. On my, on my own, yes, my wife can work, but just in case she wants to take leave for a year while she's pregnant, I can do that on my own. So um, there's vets here that make like 140, uh, $140,000 a year. That's completely possible. So the range is big. And there's definitely specialty vets, right? So um, if you wanna be a specialty surger, uh, surgeon or something like that, you can, there are people there are vets that make all the way up to $700,000 a year. It all depends on how much, how much extra learning do you want to do? And as far as the advice, just be dedicated. You know, um, there are things you're going to feel horrible. There's going to be times that, you know, you mess up um, and you're going to feel down and out. But if you just keep pushing through, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So just be dedicated, push past the hard moments and eventually eventually you'll get there. All right. 
Fantastic. Well, Dr. Richard, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you sharing your workspace and your knowledge with us. And students, um, you've asked so many awesome questions today. If something did not get answered, please go back to the Zello platform and you can ask those questions on the huddles and a variety of people in the field will be able to share their expertise with you as well. So don't forget to click on the chat and everyone have an awesome day. Thank you again, Dr. Richard.